The Higher Side Chats doesn't start with underwear ads or guilt-tripping donation pleas, nor would I ever commit the cardinal sin of podcasting and interrupt the flow mid-show to show you an unrelated sponsor. But the free first hour episodes do have to start with a little PSA before we get into it to ever so quickly remind slash inform listeners both old slash new that you're about to get into what I'm sure is a great first hour of a high level interview, but that means you're missing half the show. If you like what we do around here, get yourself a THC Plus membership and listen to the full two hour interviews as they were really designed to be and as I know you would enjoy them most. Give a little and actually get a little more in return of the thing you're actually engaging with. Five episodes every month, plus forum access, community comments, downloads to all the closing cover songs, a plus show RSS feed to use with any private RSS feed supported app, and the occasional joint session bonus shows, which include the messages you might leave me about your own theories, experiences, or otherworldly encounters at thehiresidechats.com slash voicemail. If you're not quite sure, if you just want to feel us out, or if you're only here for this particular episode, no worries. New first-time subscribers get a seven-day free trial when you sign up at thehiresidechats.com. Cancel anytime. Try it out, because it's so important to feed the things you want to grow and starve the things that gotta go. And with that said, let's get on with it already, huh? In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. It's the end of the world as we know it, people, but I feel fine doing what we do from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood. Just trying not to stare directly at the big, huge, hypnotic pocket watch of propaganda swinging to soothe the nation to sleep from cradle to grave. Facilitating our mass form psychosis society and keeping the creative spirit of the people sufficiently suppressed between the morning commute and the nightly news. Sadly, it seems like we were all born into the third quarter of a game where the opposition has a double-digit lead, but who doesn't love an underdog story? Well, the good news is that when you realize the world is run by a psychotic, parasitic sorcerer class controlling this island Earth with a complex tapestry of tacit agreements, deceptive symbolism, linguistic programming, and manipulative media, you don't often forget it. And people like today's guest Ben Joseph Stewart have dedicated many hours to packaging metaphorical red pills into powerful paradigm-changing documentaries for years now. Those who remember the glory days of the early YouTube documentaries would most likely have stumbled across Ben's masterwork, Esoteric Agenda, a personal favorite of mine from the much simpler times of 2008. Since then, Ben has made several other provocative films, from Chimatica and Ungrip, to the recently released Esoteric Agenda 2 and Awake in the Darkness, just to name a few. He's also the man behind the aptly named Ben Stewart Podcast, as well as Waking Infinity News. You can find all that and more at his website, benjosephstewart.com, and it is a real pleasure to have him here. The Esoteric Agenda Exposer, Psychedelic Cinema Sage, and 8mm Magician, Ben Joseph Stewart. Welcome to THC. Holy cow, man. I think I need you to just walk around with me whenever I go to parties, and that way you can introduce me like that. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. I like it. We'll talk. And man, this is a real honor. Going back to 2008, I was managing a sunglass hut kiosk in the Columbia, Missouri Mall, and I probably kept Esoteric Agenda playing on my laptop for several weeks when I first discovered it. One of the most impactful documentaries of my formative years. One of the first, really, to weave magic into conspiracy. It covers... The Rothschild's Coven of the Golden Dawn, John D. and Queen Elizabeth, Saturnian symbolism, corporate logos, central banking in the Federal Reserve, the 13 Illuminati bloodlines, the CFR, Trilateral Commission, and Bilderberg Group, and even a bit about how climate change would be a major catalyst for policies to control the people. A real home run from the early days, man. It felt like it went pretty viral, but I am curious what kind of impact this first film made what kind of feedback did you get because from where i was sitting it seemed like it really put you on the map no 
Hmm. Yeah, it definitely did. You know, I, I guess the only thing I would say is right before making that film, what my intent was, I was in a touring kind of prog rock group called Hyrosonic. And you could still find our album up on Spotify, our last album, which was out in, I think, 2011. But people were asking me like, yo, Ben, I know that your lyrics are meant to be a little bit cryptic, but we can tell that you're speaking about the world and you're, you're not speaking about nothing. So could you just tell us what the message is about? And that was in 2007. And I decided really when I saw Zeitgeist that I wanted to make a film about what I was noticing in the world. Because Zeitgeist, it came close to summing it up. The only thing that I felt was, I'll say two things about Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist, it was free for people. It was anonymous. It wasn't there for credit and adulation. It was well done. It had a good soundtrack. And the scope was huge. It wasn't all about one thing. And I really appreciated that. But the only thing that I saw that it was missing was it didn't really leave you feeling hopeful. And the kind of hopeful words at the end of it, it wasn't enough to really drive home. It didn't feel like it was researched. It just felt like some kind of like, hopeful words at the end and that's in no way whatsoever a dig at the film because the film is still incredible but that was me basically noticing that there was a gap that needed to be filled you mentioned that magic and conspiracy hadn't really been combined at that time only in books had i seen it combined or you know youtube lectures and i really liked how michael tassarian combined those things and I liked a few other artists that were talking about those things, but I really felt like I needed to do what Peter Joseph had done, but include human potential. And to me, that inevitably includes magic, even though that's still a word that people, they consistently go to the Hollywood version of what magic is and not the Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The kind of understanding that real magic and miracles and things are reality playing itself out in ways that we can't conceive of but are nevertheless part of reality so anyway you know that was really the impetus to get into it but the impact you were asking about i didn't know what i was getting into because i never went to school i never made demo reels i never tried to break into the market i just decided you know what i'm going to make a 15 minute film that has to do with the message of the band Six months later, I come to realize that it was a two-hour film having nothing to do with the band. And I don't think YouTube was a thing yet, or maybe it was, but it wasn't on my radar. So it was just on Google videos. And you could only upload 15 minutes at a time. You couldn't upload longer things. I, I forget what the stipulation was, but I just put the entire film up in 15-minute segments. And within a few weeks, I realized that I had no concept of what viral meant because I only sent it to a few people, but a lot of people were finding it. The numbers just rose and rose. So when I started to conceive of the fact that there's a way to get the word out to quite a few people, I had some people saying, when are you going to finish this film and put an ending on it? And that was when I was like, oh, you know, if I finish it just like this, then it's just a conspiracy film. What I really need to do is speak about our human potential and really get to the point of what the esoteric agenda is, which I think is what has stuck with me for the longest time. When somebody says esoteric agenda, it's like, oh yeah, the esoteric agenda is what the bad people are doing. And to me, I'm like, no, there's, there's really one conspirator beneath the conspiracy. And you could say that's the highest version of the self. You could say it's the Tao. Some would call it God or universal intelligence. To me, I just, I felt that none of this is wrong. It's just kind of an abrupt awakening. And shortly thereafter, I started having people asking me, hey, come down to the Amazon and try ayahuasca. And to me, when I tried ayahuasca for the first time, that really kind of sealed the deal of why sometimes conspiracy is necessary for people to hear. Now, people will push it away, but I kind of feel like I've had people say, Ben, why can't you just focus on the happier stuff? And, you know, you did Psychedelica. That was great. You did Limitless, talking about human potential. Why can't you just focus on that kind of stuff? And I say, because there's already people out there that are doing that, but nobody's bridging the gap between the uncomfortable things that we should at least look at. I'm not going to call them uncomfortable truths because conspiracy people are just as biased as people outside of conspiracy, just a little bit more well-read. 
And so the impact that I was getting was people were coming out of the woodwork saying, Ben, you changed the way that I see the world. And I kept trying to, you know, put it back in more humble terms. Like, hey, listen, I didn't wake you up. You woke you up. All I did was I made a piece of art that had a message that came from my heart. Beyond that, I didn't do anything that was you saying yes to seeing what resonated about this film in your real life and realizing that you are more. You can bring more to the table than you've ever been told before. Because I was sick and tired of all these conspiracies that they disempower people. They just make people feel like, yep, yep, the problem is big, getting bigger, and you're small, getting smaller. I was tired of that. So I really wanted to push for people to understand there is something you can do and it may not seem rational at this point, but it's just about trying and engaging and really stepping into, I want to know what my potential is. I want to know where my community is. I want to know what I can do. Because conspiracy didn't make me shove my head in the sand. For me personally, it really caused me to notice the clarity of when there seems to be crisis, all you really want to do is serve. All you really want to do is help and, and mm. you know, do something good. So that was the impact I was getting. People were saying, Ben, you, you changed or your film changed my life. And that was when I noticed, wow, a film, it can really do a lot. So I started taking it more seriously. And when I did, it just came out one year later. And I think it made even a bigger splash. It even won the New York Independent Film Festival Award for Most Scientific Film. So I started noticing that there was a, not a market, but a place for this in society. And I kind of feel like, you know, just to ramp it all the way up to what I've been up to lately, throughout all of 2021, I had my Waking Infinity news show going, and I'm still doing the same thing. I'm speaking about kind of like the nonsense that I see in the world and trying to make sense of it, not as, you know, other people are just kind of crappy and they got their heads in the sand and take a look at all the bad that's going on in the world. I was really trying to change the perspective of what's going on in the world, not to this thing where humanity is just a disease on the planet, but really that like we are a species that is in the process of waking up. Awakening is not always pretty. Just look at anyone who goes through an awakening process. They need massive amounts of support to go through that process just so they can come out the other side, not more traumatized than they went in. So I think that's what's happening in the world, and that's what I've dedicated my life to since the impact of Esoteric Agenda. But that was when I started noticing that what I was doing actually moved people. And I was a musician beforehand, and I wasn't, as a musician, trying to prove anything about my mindset or my views of the world. It was really, I wanted to move people, because when they feel moved, it's almost like this inspiration that doesn't cash itself out trying to copy the previous person who gave you inspiration. It's just you want to live your life to the fullest more when you feel that kind of inspiration. So that was what I noticed after in 2008 when Esoteric Agenda came out. Within a month, I noticed that this was my calling. Right on. <laughs> I love it. Great summary. And yeah, maybe the deepest level of the conspiracy is that we have this crazy human potential, this creative spirit that we are co-creating magicians, trained to feel powerless. And if that is true, then a typical conspiracy documentary that does leave you kind of just in awe of the totality of the big machine, it is kind of serving the big machine's purpose because, of course, the almighty elite of the Capstone Cabal, they want to seem like supervillains that can never be toppled. And so for you to put towards the end, yeah, maybe it's just more about making you feel powerless, that's important because it is kind of the medicine to the big sham. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, when you try and talk to somebody who really is not in the world of conspiracy, and really, like, we can maybe clarify later exactly what I mean by conspiracy because there's so many ways to look at that word. I forget who it was who was on your show, but somebody was mentioning the word conspiracy and saying, like, there's a very normalized one, which is Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. But really, colloquially, it's become anything that authority does not like. 
But if you think about it, when you talk to somebody who hasn't gotten into it too much, they're like, well, then how come I need you to spell it out for me? Why can't I just see it out there in the world? And we can go into, you know, how we choose not to see things that don't fit our paradigm. We can choose those things. But another thing is, I also have asked myself that question. And lately, since 2000, it feels like there's some desperate attempt to grope for power. But it's also, you know, potentially, you're right, these films that really only leave you in fear, showing you that this conspiratorial prison system that is building around us is too big for us to do anything about. And when they say we need to stand up, we need to rise up, that's way too vague for most people to be able to engage with. I think it does cause for people to, it doesn't cause for people to engage in ways that could potentially help. It causes for them to, for the most part, if you look at the majority of people, it just causes for them to become the squeaky wheels on social media, which doesn't not have its place. But I think it's also, that's what causes for a lot of people to just tune out are the louder, squeakier wheels are the ones who are, I don't know if you ever heard the term college kid syndrome. It basically means when somebody has a download, like a period where they are downloaded with a ton of information and they get it, they get it to a certain extent, but it's not applied to their life. So all they can do is really debate people or catch people and like, no, that's not what Thomas Jefferson did, blah, 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 blah. And I kind of feel like that's what's happened on social media and all the memes that are being created. Most of them, I would say, I don't know what percentage I would put on it, but most of them, they're kind of mean. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, the tone of it is just kind of mean. And some of them are very sarcastic and they're funny and they can make you laugh. But deep down inside, I feel that there's an emptiness to a lot of, you know, we could say, look, everyone's awakening. Like, yeah, but the alarm clock made us all grumpy. If you take a look at all the memes out there and the way people speak to each other through social media. So, I mean, I guess to just kind of rein this back in, what I foresee as being a really empowering tool for people are more examples of how we can communicate, not just to one another to spread ideas of what the world looks like, but what can we engage in that we're actually creating more beauty and creating something that empowers people. That's to me why I keep making art. I just made something it's about 40 minutes long with Charles Eisenstein. And it was a kind of a crappy interview that I did with him. The only crappy part was the visual. The video was very overexposed. But I covered it and I put soundtrack to it. And I sent it to Charles and he's not an easy guy to please. And he says, this is the best somebody has covered my material without making it cheesy or, you know, syrupy or new agey you really hit the nail on the head. And to me, that's what I think we could be doing more of. Think back to Alan Watts with like, you know, down tempo electronica behind him. It's a pleasure to listen to. And I, I definitely feel, especially in this Web3 world that looks like is really gaining traction, that the decentralization and the more owner and builder control over things like NFTs and over things like pieces of artwork I think that may actually gain a lot of traction. I would just really like to see it done in an inspiring tone rather than such a catty, frustrated, angry, or sarcastic tone. As much as I do like some good sarcasm, it really needs the artistry behind it. Otherwise, it just sounds cheap and rude. So, I don't know. <laughs> well, cheers to that. I agree with you. Tone is important. Leaving people hopeful is important. I struggle with it. We all do. It is what it is. And if we're talking about a documentary that's 14 years old now and something as dense as Esoteric Agenda, there's going to be hits and there's going to be misses. And in terms of the uncomfortable stuff that sounds like a hit to me, there's a clip of a woman's speech about Codex Alimentarius, this initiative that she says was run by the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization on behalf of the UN. She says that in 1994, they had a press release where they declared nutrients toxic. They created the policy that every dairy cow must be treated with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone. Every animal must be treated with subclinical antibiotics and growth hormones. And that the vitamin and mineral guidelines alone 
she says, when it was going to go into global implementation in 2009, would result in a minimum of 3 billion deaths, 1 billion through starvation, the next 2 billion would die of preventable diseases and subpar nutrition. And rewatching that from 2021, it's like, well, there is coordination between global food and medicine think tanks. And sure, 3 billion dead sounds like a lot, but how many people since 1994 have died of preventable disease, obesity, bad diet, cancer? I'm not sure if we're hitting those huge numbers, but people are way less healthy than they were in the 90s. And the fruits of those plans seem as ripe as ever. But the part that maybe didn't age so well were the aspects focused on 2012 and this premise that we were primed for a level jump in human consciousness, that the light body was on the way, that this was a race with the global elite to suppress this evolution of man that was coming from this new energetic bombardment from our position in the cosmos. As you say in the film, this isn't your idea. It's something that's been talked about by gurus and spiritual masters for years. So it's really just an interpretation and trying to bring a bunch of threads together to make some kind of sense out of what was going to be the next few years. People are still saying that, that we should expect that. But what are your thoughts now? Did the elite win in managing to suppress it? Is it still coming just on a longer timeline? What do you think? Well, you know, honestly, a lot of what you said, I do feel it is still very much so in effect. I appreciate you bringing up the 2012 aspect because I could say that was probably the first time and one of the last times ever that I have spoken about like a prophecy coming to fulfillment and a specific date where something may happen. So I let Greg Braden say it. You know, I found this footage of Greg Braden and I let him say it, where he was talking about the Schumann resonance. Admittedly, I mean, this guy, I'm forgetting the exact credentials of Greg Braden, but as I looked into it, I was like, well, this guy's checking on the Schumann resonance, and if what he's saying is correct, it does look like there's this flatlining point around 2012. Turns out, didn't happen, and happy to admit that, and you know, just for everyone listening, again, when I set out to make that film in 2008, Esoteric Agenda, it was stream of consciousness and everything I researched just about made it into the film. It wasn't like I was researching for 12 years beforehand and then decided to make a film. The research really started happening at the same time that I was making that decision. So the 2012 thing really didn't pan out unless you could say, well, we just got the numbers wrong and it's really 2021. And, you know, then I could probably point you towards, yeah, it, it looks like, you know, something's happening right now. But I haven't been really getting into what were in those films a little bit more of the new agey or pseudoscience-y predictions about what's happening. But, you know, I like, I also very much so appreciate that that expresses who I was at the very beginning of my journey. And you're right, the film hit the way it hit. The thing about Dr. Ema Ray LeBeau, and she was, I think, wife of Colonel Stubblebine, the guy um, who was featured at the beginning of the men who stare at goats. He tried walking through that wall or running through that wall. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that whole idea of Codex Alimentarius, as soon as I put out that film, I was asked to come up to Canada to start doing a series of talks. And so I did. And as I was speaking to people in Canada, they said, well, this is not called Codex Alimentarius up here. I think it was Bill C6 or C36, or I forget exactly which one it was, but they were saying what seems like is happening up here in Canada is there are these councils getting together saying that parents and especially mothers are treating their children with vitamins like vitamin C and vitamin D. Yeah. And God forbid we let these unaccredited scientists try and treat their children as with like, you know, whatever's in their cupboard, like a witch, right? So we can't have that. And so it, apparently it was this thing that was going to start in Canada as a test bed and maybe trickle down this way. But when you were mentioning like the bovine injections, I remember putting all that stuff in there. But what's interesting, what it makes me think of is, have you heard about the deer that like almost a third, if not more, of the deer population, in at least in the U.S. that have been studied, 
seem to have COVID and they're thinking about vaccinating the deer. <laughs> I heard about animals at the zoo, even the San Diego Zoo. There was this thing about, oh, we got to vaccinate the gorillas. And I'm not surprised that they're going to that degree because it's just like it seems like a giant money making scheme where we got to get this product into each and everything that we can. Trees will be next, I suppose. Well, for sure. I mean, so there's two places I want to go with this. And then maybe I have a question for you. Like when you say trees, there's this thing called the International Barcode of Life, maybe initiative. I'm not sure what the last word, but it's International Barcode of Life. One of the main funders of it is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or maybe Microsoft. It's one of those two. But the International Barcode of Life is basically this idea of taking the sequence genome of every living thing on planet Earth and having it in this database, which is, at the end of the day, I think this is also where science is going. You don't need a conspiracy to see why tech companies would want that. If you go to, man, what was it called? BG? It was this Chinese genomics company. It was the largest genomics company in the world. Bill Gates helped bring a headquarters of them to Seattle. And they also have the dream of basically sequencing the genome of every living thing on planet Earth and having a barcode attached to it. And in that, I do believe there's a connection between that and this thing called the sentient world simulation. And the sentient world simulation is something that is loosely operational right now, nowhere near where, you know, let's say um, it hasn't hit its stride yet. The data proliferation hasn't hit its stride yet. And it's basically something that using all the points of data coming from all the different places where data can come through, through the internet of everything, into this sentient world simulation, which basically does what you saw in Westworld, which is mm. making a mirror of this world, but with a lot of data points coming in in real time. And, you know, maybe let's throw out the minority report idea. Because the idea of the sentient world simulation is to be able to predict things in real time about not just individuals, but groups, like collective groups. Where are their interests? Are they going to rise up against a new bill? Where might they amass? Where would they go if they were going to speak behind closed doors? And this would be happening in real time and potentially becoming predictive, using the algorithm to become predictive. And one of the main, I guess, philosophies that it goes off of is that a human being is actually more mysterious than a collective of humans. So mm -hmm. you would imagine that a human is very complex. So an entire civilization must be even more complex. But it actually turns out, at least philosophically and theoretically, that entire civilizations are much more understandable. And it's really just, it comes down to statistics. So for me, will it be the trees next? And what would be the agenda? I really do feel like it doesn't matter what the excuse is. Can we harvest the genes and the genome so we can sequence the genome of every living thing out there? And to do so, what excuse would we have to make? Could we just say that this is what we want to do? Potentially. And they have, you know, many of these groups have said it out there. But I wonder, for me, I'm not sure what your thoughts are on the PCR tests. You know, there's this Biden $173 million testing facility for COVID that is slated not to be done until late 2024, if that, maybe 2025. Meaning, it sounds like we're planning on there being more or at least preparing for the possibility of there being more epidemics from mm -hmm. this point, whether it's coronavirus or something new, this is going to be the way of the future. Whereas a year ago, The Sun reported kooky conspiracy theorists, especially anti-vaxxers, are saying that there's some agenda to implant people with microchips. And then the very same company, one year later, comes out and says, look at this amazing company called Epsilon out of Sweden that are having these vax parties and introducing this microchip that will stand as their vax passport underneath their skin. Right. It's this very same company that reported on this. So my 
again, getting back to the PCR thing where Carrie Mullis said, you know, this isn't the way to test if somebody is actively sick with coronavirus. Really, PCR is there to replicate genetics very rapidly. And then you send it off to God knows where. A lot of them, I think, go to Boston University, at least here in the United States, where it gets sequenced and it gets stored. I'm a filmmaker. I'm just going to say it like that. I'm not an investigative journalist like some of them out there. I'm more of a filmmaker, and I really try to move people rather than prove. But to me, I kind of feel like, yeah, if the plan is, oh, it looks like half the or almost half the deer population has COVID, let's vaccinate them. And if you're curious or maybe hesitant about what these vaccines are, wouldn't you just want to ask some questions, put on the brakes a little bit more and ask, like, wait a minute, what is this thing? What are we really trying to do here? And is this injection, and I again, I have no problem with it. I really don't. I'm just, me personally, not going to get it because I like going to first resort rather than last resort first. So I'll take care of my health through fundamental things like movement, breathing, detoxification, sweat, you know, exercise, being social, getting enough sun, the things that are foundational, the things that the news will never tell you about, the things that are, for the most part, non-monetizable. So to me, I don't know what's next. I do believe trees are next. And I do know that there are many tech companies that aren't evil out there, and they're actually trying to find ways to use technology to stimulate root growth for trees so we can get young saplings growing a lot quicker. I think it's a very muddled kind of world that we're in and trying to make sense out of what's happening, especially if you're a filmmaker and you're going to make it almost seem singular, which I don't think it is anymore. Again, I, I know I made a film where I was saying there's this thing called the Illuminati, but in my growth, I've come to understand that even if the Illuminati were still around in some capacity, that power is splintered. Yes. But the agenda almost seems to be an epiphenomena because the agenda doesn't seem to go away. So that's my thoughts. And I guess I would turn it back to you and ask you, have you been curious about the PCR test? Did you like come to ask any questions inside your own head? Like, is it really just for testing or is there more to it? I have to ask you that because I know you, you do some hard work <laughs> and you study this stuff. Well, yeah, you always got to wonder with anything that's getting this much attention and full court press, what's really going on, because there's usually a game under the game. And it does seem like the idea that gives the elite the biggest teenage level control boner is really trying to invert everything that's natural. And how will they achieve all this barcode of life stuff? Probably just through fear and making it seem risky to not do it. We need to know where your tomato has been from soil all the way to your mouth. We got to track that because the world's so dangerous. So I think a lot of that is coming. PCR tests, I mean, you know, the most interesting part about Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s latest book about Anthony Fauci is he goes over the AIDS crisis and he says this was exactly one of the techniques that Fauci has recycled because that was the first time where people were testing asymptomatic individuals. The whole system said, we got to test everybody. And it's a faulty test. There's a lot of false positives. So then you take people who are totally fine and healthy, you test them and they hit positive, and then they go in for treatment. And they were doing this AZT stuff that was killing people. But when you get someone with a positive test, you put them in the hospital bed, you pump them full of drugs and they die, the system can easily say, well, that was AIDS. HIV got them. And I think that a lot of that is also being recycled today, according to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and other people who know a lot more about these things than me. But those are the, the people that I pay attention to. But in terms of like a much deeper and darker and kind of esoteric -y aspect, you know, what you're talking about now does kind of relate to something I was going to bring up about your recent follow up, Esoteric Agenda 2. And just to summarize that for people, you do cover the coronavirus and 5G, not necessarily that there is an overlap, but they're both topics in the documentary. You play clips from Dr. Tom Cowan. You cover The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg, things people would know around here. 
you show that the image of the virus was seated on the 20 pound note. That's very uh, on brand for esoteric agenda. And you also mentioned the exodus of 1300 CEOs just before COVID hit. Clearly they knew something in advance. And it seems like according to the documentary and the major themes that this was another black swan event. They apparently plan one every 90 years, 1779 revolutionary war, 1864 civil war, 1945 world war two. And this is just another pre-planned worldwide reset in some super cycle Makes sense to me. It's a very good and solid sequel. But even more recently, what I was trying to get to is I saw the Omicron episode of Waking Infinity News. And you talk about the film Omicron from 1963, which the plot of it is an Earth man's body being taken over by an alien so they could check out the place and see how they could take over the entire planet. And you say... I'll tell you, first contact has already happened. We don't understand what we're looking at and we're squirting it inside of our bodies. Now, that is a provocative thing to say. Not exactly about testing, but in terms of there being something deeper to the shot, I mean, that's about as as deep as you could speculate. Can you elaborate on what you mean there? How could the injection for this supposed global pandemic relate to aliens or some kind of other being colonizing us potentially even. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that question. And I would say when it comes to, I'm not making a straight up claim (laughs) that, okay, I've seen enough video footage. There's, oh my God, just recently, I'm wondering if you've seen it. I'm trying to remember the name of who actually sent it out there. It was Ricardo something saying, you know, here, I have video footage of the tech that's inside these vaccines. To me, okay, I'm not going to say that I fully believe it, because I also believe that online, the best way to discredit legitimate conspiracy theories is not to attack them, but it's to add to them a level of incredulity a level of ridiculousness to it. So in that respect, I do remember saying that, and I do believe that we, we don't really understand what technology truly is. We can categorize it. We can name it. We can say that, you know, right now we're looking at technology as being the smart gadgets that are hooked to the cloud. But really, technology is also math. In a much more crude sense, it's math. It's a way of manipulating the resources that are around and within you in order to arrive quicker and more seamlessly without as much calorie expenditure at the result that you want. So to me, right now we're looking at, now they're not UFOs anymore, they're UAPs, and we're hearing a lot about it. And to me, it just feels kind of like, oh, right on time, interesting. Yeah, it's like an onboarding process. It feels like that. And I've even put it in previous episodes where I'm like, did you see the New Year's Eve event from 2019 into 2020? It was a holographic projection around the Seattle needle in the sky. Did you happen Hmm. to see that? Probably. Vaguely, it sounds familiar, but it's not fresh in my mind. It would blow your mind. You know, so just for the audience, YouTube... 2020 New Year's Eve needle in the sky, and it will show you what projection technology is up to now. And for me, I just kind of said, listen, so now we're hearing about like contact and the Navy has no idea what this stuff is. I forget Richard Dolan was saying something about there being ASRO, Anomalous Surveillance and Resolution Office, And they are basically mandated to conduct investigations of UFO and UAPs and to report it to Congress. And then also back in November, the DOD established the AOIMSG, which is Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group. It's a mouthful, but basically it's just showing you that intelligence agencies are getting more involved with what are these unidentified craft? What does it mean? And if you were to look at at where projection technology is at today, like that needle in the sky New Year's 2020 event, it almost goes back to Werner von Braun 
and I forget the lady's name that he told on his deathbed and said it many times before, but there's going to be several different iterations of global events that will culminate in alien contact. Mm -hmm. And apparently he said to her, I wish I could remember her name, but it was Werner von Braun who said to her, remember, it's all fake. And so she was saying this well before 2020 and the talk of the UAPs and any of those things. So to me, I'm just, as I'm saying, I think first contact already happened. This is something that maybe Max Egan got in my ear a little bit too much. But when I was living in Colorado, he was out at my wedding and he was laying it all out for me. Like, look at all these magic sigils and how close they look to like circuit boards. And I really wonder, you know, John D and all these magicians from the past using these symbols and using some kind of um, emotional charge and focus of mental acuity while using these symbols and imbuing them with more and more power. To me, I've come to wonder, like, is this technology that we have, is this really something that we have created? And I can see that as being very possible. But also, the more that I understand that, like, if there were some kind of force, otherworldly or pan-dimensional, whatever, that could somehow communicate through, okay, people are talking about like DMT creatures and things along those lines, and we produce DMT in our very own brain, and maybe not as much as we used to back in the day when you could get DMT and the MAOI that is in ayahuasca that helps it pass through the gut and get to your brain, in higher amounts in things like oranges and citrus fruits. So to me, I kind of feel that if there were something communicating with us, beckoning us for us to build it, almost like if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I mean by first contact. To me, truthfully, I really do believe it's already happened and we're building the infrastructure for it. But it can't just arrive here what has to happen is we need to retrofit. Like if we are going to go to Mars, what do we have to do to Mars so we humans can live there? Well, we need to retrofit it. We need to have some kind of atmosphere that we can survive within. And to me, if you look at post-2020, you said it. Esoteric Agenda 2, just for the audience, I raced to get that thing out just so I could talk about a couple of the topics that I wanted to talk about. And since 2020... I don't believe that 5G causes coronavirus, and I know that a lot of people were saying there's a direct correlation. Maybe the only correlation is since 2020, if you look outside, how many more 5G towers do you see now than you did beforehand? Mm -hmm. So it at least gave room, all this quarantine and lockdown gave room for the infrastructure for the next telecommunications giant 5G to come online. And by the way, the difference between 4G bandwidth, like download time and stuff along those lines, and 5G is the difference between a hose and the channel. So <laughs> the channel can fit entire vehicles inside it. So what is that, like 100,000 hoses that could fit inside there? So it's really a quantum leap in the bandwidth and this is important to get everybody in the metaverse where they're more interacting, not with terra firma, not with the actual earth, but with this simulated reality. And if you look mm -hmm. at Dr. David E. Martin, he's saying, listen, what people are injecting inside them, I would not call it a vaccine. I think it's wrong to call it a vaccine because it doesn't meet the criteria of vaccines in the past. And it is a simulation. It's a simulated mRNA code that's being injected. Some people say there's graphene in it, yada, yada. I'm not going to get into the details. But to answer your question, that's kind of where I was going with that is I feel that nobody's asking enough questions. So I almost had to get a little bit more cheeky with it and say, like, listen, yeah, first contact. No one believes that anything's going on, but we're willing to just like, oh, wait, there's this pandemic. Okay. What's the first thing I should do? Okay, well, let's jump to last resort. That to me is what that feels like. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sure you and many other people have noticed because I've heard people say it before. Why does the news not mention at all how important social bonds and social connections are for health? Why is it not mentioned about the power of sunlight 
the power of vitamin C, the power of proper hydration, moving your body, not sitting all the time. Why is that never mentioned? Not a word of it is mentioned. Right. That to me, if that's not conspiratorial, you know, it's at least that we are allowing for these archetypal giants, these gods, these huge transnational companies to basically have a stranglehold over not just what we can buy, where we can buy it, how we can move around, where our data is sent, but also what we're allowed to think and talk about. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was my comment saying, I do believe we've hit first contact. And I think that technology, what we're doing to the planet really does seem like we're building a terrarium for something other than human. Yeah. And I do believe that it is an offshoot of the human species, whatever you want to call it, but it's an offshoot of the human species that will hook, line, and sinker fuse with technology as deeply as they are told to by the consensus. You know, we police ourselves. We don't need to be policed because we police ourselves if we get it into our brain that other people should follow whatever the word of the day is. Yeah. So, you know, like it's no longer two masks and whatever anymore. It's been proven that, and I'm just speaking out of the, you know, the other side of my mouth now, it's been proven that if you sit down at a restaurant, you can take your mask off and you're fine. So now everybody should be crawling from place to place. You can't walk anymore, right? And <laughs> I'm curious how many people would actually do that. Right, too many. And I'm not saying that we're all idiots. What I am saying is that I think we find more comfort in the conventional view of what's going on in the world. and. Most of us are not looking for truth. We're looking for comfort. And if you look at historically, it feels more comfortable in the herd. So what do you do when you're in the herd? You speak like the herd. You talk like the herd. You go where the herd, wherever they go. And it's the outliers that are consistently the ones that first hear about danger. I really do think that's what conspiracy theorists are, we're the outliers, we're the ones that aren't afraid to look at the uncomfortable topics. Unfortunately, we've lost our role in society. We seem to come across as these lepers, like, you know, we can say like, look at the Jewish people and look at the African Americans, look at the Native Americans, look at women by and large. And I say, yes, absolutely. Look at the inequality all around, especially look at the conspiracy theorists, because from the dawn of time, they've never had a good name. <laughs> right, so right. to me, that's kind of what I see is we are in a situation where most people, I just don't think they are going to wake up because it hasn't been tokenized. It hasn't been incentivized for them. And I do believe that all we have to do, the ones who see the writing on the wall, is to bring it into fashion. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually see that that's what's happening with conspiracy because now everything's a conspiracy. If you know, <laughs> like just wait six months and it'll be proven right. Yeah, business is good. Exactly. <laughs> and what I think is, I think we're normalizing what conspiracy is. I can almost see that in three to five years, daily talk shows, those ones that most of us find repulsive, daily talk shows are going to be just talking about conspiracy left and right. I think it's getting normalized. Hmm. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I know that I, I talked about 50 other things other than the question that you asked me there, but I do believe we've made first contact. If there is a first contact, I believe it's already here. And I believe we just don't realize that an aspect of it is sitting inside all of our homes. Mm -hmm. And it is this thing that we're building, the infrastructure for it. The body that we are retrofitting this planet to house is all this technology that's exploding like gangbusters. And there's no Trump that can stop it, right? There's no like one savior that's going to stop it. Because even though Trump gets in there saying, I worry about China, what does he say? He, like, I want 5G faster than China has 5G. So he wants to race towards it, just like the vaccines, Operation Warp Speed. And nobody who even likes Trump remembers that this all started from Operation Warp Speed. And then on top of that, if you look at Mar-a-Lago, I don't know how big that compound really is, but Trump made sure that no 5G towers are inside that perimeter. Ah. And it's the same thing as Steve Jobs inventing 
or co-inventing because it was his team that really did probably the hard work, the smart tablets and the smart devices. But what did Steve Jobs not give his own children? So I think we really need to start taking a look at there is a deeper agenda that maybe no one entity or person or secret society really has a stranglehold over, but maybe they just have their thumb to the pulse a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Wow. A lot of great stuff there. But with that last point, yeah, I mean, that to me is the value of conspiracy. Watch what they do, not what they say. If they're inventing smartphones and iPads and not letting their kids use them, well, that's pretty telling. And so to me, that is actually, to bring it back to esoteric agenda, that is why I got interested in magic. Because it's like, if the elite are using these techniques against us that were taught are silly, maybe they're not so silly and they're actually quite powerful and I should learn about them and how I could implement some things into my own life that might be advantageous. But you are right. There's so many different angles to look at so many different things. I did actually look at the New Year's Eve needle in the sky. I've just seen an image of it, but it couldn't look any more like a portal opening with demonic tentacles coming out of the top and bottom of it. It's pretty wild. It tells a story. It shows cellular mitosis. It shows a chrysalis and a butterfly emerging from it. I'm not going to break it down symbolically, but I, I think it was also a story of what's happening. Maybe it was a hopeful one. Who knows? Makes sense. Makes sense. A lot like the uh, London Olympic Games, a lot of these mm. ceremonies, they do tell a big story and maybe they're using magic and seeding certain ideas to get us to co-create them. And what about that Tupac hologram? We never seen anything like that since. And maybe you're right about that whole angle of first we're going to use international terrorism, then we're going to use the fake alien invasion, then I think he says it's going to be asteroids. So then I look at the BBC journalists that are obsessing about asteroids, and I'm like, maybe the Earth's flat and there are no asteroids. It's just <laughs> like, you really never know. But in terms of us potentially being terraformed, there's definitely something strange and unknown about the nexus of AI and spirits or alien beings. And Silicon Valley seems like it has some pretty deep secrets in that regard. Maybe we are dealing with some kind of terraforming something similar to like giving native Americans smallpox tainted blankets, but on a cosmic scale hmm. and it's in these shots, they're just clearing the people out before they come in and take over. There's a lot of strange possibilities, but in one of your episodes of waking infinity news, you say, I love when my beliefs are rattled by new incoming information. And I so agree with that. It's very exciting it's been a lot of the fuel for this show, but I am getting a lot harder to impress. Feels like I've heard it all. And for me, the last rabbit hole that really got me thinking has been about the mud flood stuff and the idea of cataclysms in conjunction with a huge global reset. Everybody's looking forward in this global reset and like, oh, what would happen? Well, maybe it's happened before. Maybe it wasn't so long ago. It's something I know you've looked into. You did a great breakdown of the old architecture that we see before power tools were invented across Russia, Europe, and the US. San Francisco is a great example because we have this panorama picture of the city full of modern buildings but no people and no photos of it during initial construction that's weirder because people say oh well there's no people in the photos well long exposure times maybe they didn't show up but i think they would show up as trails but either way the fact that there's no photos of it during initial construction is weird and you can see plenty of photos of reconstruction after the big fire they had and the earthquake that happened years later it just seems like many places that you show examples of, that the mud flood people are examining, when you dig down, when they excavate a lot of these early 1900s buildings, you find a couple of stories of detailed architecture, like as if the surface was a lot lower. It's not just foundations like you'd expect, like digging up a basement. No, they, they chiseled in detailed formations that are supposed to be seen, but they're underground. And this is all over the place, as if a lot of cities... Maybe they weren't built by the people who say they built them, but they were just discovered and moved into. Like when the Europeans came over, maybe part of that was already there. It gets really weird. And some people start talking about plasma and start talking about ether 
and that maybe there is some mechanism in our environment that does just liquefy matter. And it, it, it's strange, wild stuff. But what are your thoughts on the whole mud flood hypothesis and hidden history and that maybe the whole timeline really needs to be reexamined? You know, this is what I love about being a filmmaker because it's not really that I get to hide behind that and say, oh, well, don't look at me. I'm just a filmmaker trying to put ideas out there. I really do as much research as I can. But what I love about having gotten into conspiracy is that it opens my mind to consider more. So it's not really about the conspiracy itself because, I mean, you and I have been in this game a while. Would you say that your ideas of exactly what you believed back when you started have evolved at least, if not changed? Absolutely. I'm pretty agnostic on pretty much everything. Yeah. So to me, that's kind of what I love about taking a look at these things and at least using, let's say, the archetype of conspiracy as the more powerful thing than the specific conspiracies that you're trying to prove. Because anyone who's into conspiracy, you've probably been that guy or girl who's at a party. Everyone wants to just relax and tell dick and fart jokes. And you're talking about building seven, right? Everyone who has been super passionate about something has been that person who's trying to tell somebody who you can't seem to understand that they're just looking for the moment that this conversation ends so they can get away. And you're sitting there with buggy eyes talking about these things. That's usually because it's like the college kid syndrome. You get a download and you want to share it and you don't know how else to share it. And there's not enough cultural examples of how to share these things well. But to me, as I've been on it in the long haul, I've started to realize that I love it as some kind of vehicle that drives me through all these different theories. I really did look at Flat Earth, and I'm not saying that I've closed the book on it. I think this planet is freaking weird. I just personally think it's probably more of a holographic explanation that I will understand better than how the flat thing works. And, you know, I've talked to some really, really intelligent people that just have not come out of the closet and they believe that, listen, I don't believe it's just flat, flat. I just don't know if I believe the round thing floating around in space. And to me, I still do. I still do believe the round thing floating around in space. But conspiracy, because it's been around for so long in me, it has allowed me to say like, listen, I'm not here to make people feel stupid for their beliefs because that's the first thing that any conspiracy theorist, anyone who gets into this field, that's the first problem that other people will bring to you is that they just don't want to listen. So I've decided to listen. And one thing that came out of the flat earth um, realm of researchers is this idea of mud flood and Tartary, Tartaria. So there's this CIA document that got unearthed, declassified, talking about how through Russia and ancient Tartary is not really that ancient. It's where you would call like Russia and Siberia and into China. And so this theory that came out, this CIA document to stay on point, basically said that there is this push to erase Tartary from history. Now, whatever that really means, you can look at it as just Tartary, but you can also see that it's possible and it is a push for some powers that be to erase history. So it makes you wonder, well, what don't I know? All those book burnings, all of the potential even technology that's held in the Holy of the Holies, beneath the Vatican. God knows we, with access only to the internet, and maybe we can buy a few books every now and then, we're trying to piece together the history of this planet, which is incredible. So to me, as I've started to look into what is the mud flood, well, a lot of people have researched and said that it looks to be that there are these maps, the Piri Rees maps that come from the end of the 1500s, beginning of the 1600s, that show a well-mapped out territory of the North Pole, not as an ice cap, but actually as strangely, almost looking like Atlantis, this circle with four rivers pouring straight towards the middle. And then shortly thereafter, the next map shows that it looks like it's flooded. I'm going to go on record saying that 
I don't know how to verify the legitimacy of these maps, but I do know that if you look at the Piri Rees maps, they are, and there's an interesting spelling to them, but it's at least enough to ask the question like, were there actually ports? Was this actually a landmass? And now it's just covered. And a lot of things about the South Pole have been brought up as well. And monuments found or this huge indentation under the ice. And as the ice is melting, satellite imagery can see that there are structures in Antarctica. So I look at all this and I'm just kind of curious what happened on this planet and how many times has it been reset by a cataclysm or something along those lines? So the flat earth idea is that there's this liquefaction and liquefaction means that when there's a certain vibratory frequency, and this could happen by an earthquake, when it hits land mass, it starts to liquefy and everything turns into mud. So you will see that there are houses, I think there's even footage out there showing liquefaction and houses in real time sinking into the mud, sinking into the foundation that they were once firmly rooted on. So there's that idea of liquefaction and how the earth can start swallowing large edifices. And from that, also potentially mud having come down from Canada into the U.S. and from the North Pole into other parts of the Northern Territory of the globe. So the way that these people have decided to research that is, well, what would have been the remnants of the bygone era? And you see all these immaculate buildings that do, I mean, you go throughout Canada, you go throughout all of North America, you can find it all throughout Europe, and I think somewhat in the Southern Hemisphere, but not as much, I think, and I could be actually wrong about this, maybe not at all in the Southern Hemisphere, but these ginormous buildings with these huge, huge doorways, and some people are like, well, it must have been for giants. Well, we don't know that. We just know that this is the kind of architecture that we are not seeing today. And if you understand about resonance, there's this guy, Dr. Ibrahim Karim, with biogeometry. He shows that the shape of a room will basically dictate how vibratory frequencies exist inside that shape. So there are some shapes that are better for sleep. There are some shapes that are better for school and learning. There are some shapes that are better for inspiration. So if you look at these ancient buildings, it really does look like they are not just there for visual appeal, but they actually have some kind of vibratory frequency built into their structure. And if you had Court Lindale or Lindahl, I'm not sure how you mm -hmm. pronounce it, on your show before talking about Thomas Jefferson and some of the sites that he was setting up on these specific lines that point all the way to Bale Beck across the Atlantic Ocean. So with this, there's at least something to look into and why today most of the architecture seems very square. And if you look at biogeometry and the understanding of how the shape of a room will, will allow resonance to exist inside of it, these squares don't do the same thing as these magnificent buildings that may have been all around the world before some catastrophe that happened maybe the turn of 1500s into 1600s, some say all the way up into the 17 or 1800s. So that's the mud flood thing. And I just want to say that like, there's one thing that I noticed, if you haven't seen the One World Religion Headquarters set to open next year, it's literally called the One World Religion Headquarters. It's really supposed to be a collaboration between Catholicism and Islam. But there's these three large buildings that are cubes. They're just cubes. And it's not like old architecture. So the last thing I'm going to say on that is I've studied a lot of the indigenous in the Americas and where did they come from? And you can look at the haplogroups in their DNA. It's quite diverse. There were Europeans down at the, I forget what bog it was called, but it was down in Florida where European DNA found more than 6,000 years ago. Graham Hancock reported on his last book, America Before, that there are, around San Diego, Native American, it wasn't a real finding showing that there was some kind of group there, but if they can piece through these elephant or mammoth tusks that are about 150,000 years old to actually prove that the incisions on these bones were man-made and it wasn't just time breaking them apart, then the whole out-of-Africa theory would be completely different.
So bringing this up to modern times, there are a lot of early, like William Penn and early writers from the U.S. that have written about how a lot of the Native Americans have Tartar stature, and they look like Tartar Jews. They dress, and a lot of their ceremonies and stuff like that very much so resemble the Tartars. So that got me thinking, like, okay, Tartar, Tartarian. And then there's also Africans that were found here mm -hmm. and around San Francisco, present-day San Francisco, which apparently was built in 30 years between, I think it was like 1740-something and 1770-something. Most people are saying, like, there's no way San Francisco could have been built in 30 years, the way that it was built. Without the excavation tools that we have today, it still would have been ridiculous. Even with today's standard, it still would have been ridiculous with the population of roughly, a, what did they say, 300,000? I think 300,000, and not all of them were workers. So there's a lot of questions that came up to me with the mud flood that's like, yeah, you know, like I've never even thought to question why all these orphanages were around and orphan power was used like child labor came from a lot of these children working in factories. And just to give one last thought is that in San Francisco where there were Africans there and some people believe from the Mali Empire. I have a couple books right here that's really digging deep into not just their presence here, but their presence all around the globe, African kings. And we never hear about these things, but that they had incredible sanitation. They had these open air markets with any kind of vegetable and fruit, chocolate, candies, breath fresheners, deodorants, you name it in these markets. And that a lot of the slaves that are here or that were here in the United States may not have actually come from Africa. And I think it was Emotep Jesus, who was on Joe Rogan, who brought this up. And he even mentioned that, uh, like, they pulled it up and they said, oh, well, it looks like 13 million, something like 12, maybe 12.7 million Africans in the slave trade. But how many documented boats came from Africa or how many of them are documented to have come over on boats and it was something like three to four hundred thousand so there are a lot of questions that even if you go to our very own literature it's not like you just need to believe some new person coming up with new theories if you go back and with a critical eye really ask questions to how did these world fairs get set up so quickly yeah. some people are saying the world fairs that they had back in tesla's day there's no way you could set that up in a matter of a couple months it would have taken two to four years by some engineers beliefs so that's really what got me into mud flood if anyone wants to dig deeper into the tartary thing and the alternative timeline of even biblical history you can go to anatoly fomenko's work yeah. and he's really just kind of breaking down like the Temple of Solomon is not where you think it is. Egypt is not where present-day Egypt is. It was closer to being like Russia or Eastern Europe. And I don't believe all of it. I have to say that. I don't always believe all of it, but it's at least enough for me to be like, okay, I'm going to look deeper at it, and I'm just not going to hook, line, and sinker believe what's conventional. I don't mind if I look crazy. I don't mind if people say, Ben, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. Because I'm not ruining my life over it. I'm not sitting in front of the computer telling other people that they're sheeple and you need to believe me. I could care less. I'm staring into the abyss, but I'm firmly rooted on terra firma. What I do supports a family of five. I have a lot of joy in my life. I just also happen to love questioning things that most people, they'll just believe because it's the norm. Mm. You're here. Yes. <laughs> I'm right there with you. It's the bread and butter. Man, just really excellent to talk to you. I'm so glad we did this. Finally, you know, as we're coming to the end of the road, I wanted to make sure we touched on another one of your latest works. It's a film called Awake in the Darkness, and it focuses on Aubrey Marcus, who a lot of people probably know as a friend of Rogan and he and his partner in On It. He was the first one I ever really heard break down an Amazonian ayahuasca retreat, and for that I'm thankful. And now this film of yours follows him through a darkness ritual ceremony in the Black Forest of Germany, where he does several days in pitch black darkness, and it does crazy things to the mind. I know we're running over, 
the joy of uh, a podcast is that there really is no over. It's just I can't take up a person's whole day. Uh, but before we go, this is one of your latest works. We got to tell people about it. Yeah, man. Well, I, I really do appreciate that. And yes, this film is still, I'm putting a little bit of work to it. We're going to the 2022 film festival market. And I really appreciated it because, yeah, it was about Aubrey Marcus going into a week-long darkness retreat. And what's very interesting about it was I don't even think he put together the significance until I went and I interviewed him of the timing because it was uh, the very end of January 2020 that he came out of the darkness. And that was when he realized that the world had changed. It was like he went into the darkness in one world and he came out a week later and the world started going into lockdowns. And I think it was like maybe a week later that he stepped down from on it. Oh. I'm not sure. But um, he was another one of those CEOs that stepped down. And I mean, he's hip. He's with it. I've had some of these conversations with him. He just doesn't go balls to the wall with a lot of some of the things he believes. He also finds it very fascinating to just explore consciousness. And that's why I love that he came to me for this film. But we had 30 minutes to cover in darkness because he he filmed himself before and he did audio recording during the darkness retreat and then he filmed himself afterwards and i just did a couple more interviews and i put it all together but i had 30 minutes of darkness he recorded four hours i whittled that down to 30 minutes and the very curious thing was how are you going to cover as a filmmaker how are you going to cover 30 minutes of darkness and we did so with we left it dark for a little bit. We really covered it with sound design because a lot of people don't realize that sound design, I think, is more important than the quality of the visuals. And many filmmakers agree. And then with that, I worked for three months on a part that is just one minute and 44 seconds. And if you remember that while you're watching it, you'll know when the moment comes about. What I liked about it was it wasn't a film to try and prove to you a way of looking at the world. It was just a journey into the darkness with Aubrey Marcus. But he speaks very philosophically. He speaks about, you know, why am I so sad? Like, why is this stuff going on with me? And, you know, I don't want to give away the whole story, but he's really wrestling with something that happened to his father years before. Not even too long before, but it was when he did his first ayahuasca ceremony his father started losing his mind as he was on this religious crusade to find God. And so he goes into the darkness in a sense to kind of find like, what is this thing that my dad had? And I'm on this kind of crusade, not a crusade, but a quest to find the deeper meanings of me and life and religion. And he's really battling a lot of very interesting things inside himself. And it's really beautiful to watch him go through that journey. So I mean, the film, I really appreciated making it, and I know we're going to do more work, but if you go to AubreyMarcus.com, you'll find it. I think it's right on the home page, and you can watch it. It's free. you got to give your email address over, but other than that, it's free, and you get to watch this film and see my latest work. I'm really proud of it. I really loved working on the soundtrack and all the sound design, the visuals. And I think it's got a great message for people. And it's also like if you're not one who's, if the audience is listening still, but you're not one for all these conversations that we've had so far today, it doesn't get into that stuff. It really just kind of shows a human on a journey of self-discovery, which is really like at the core of all my work, that's really all I want people to get more interested in is themselves. Right on. Yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It brings to mind just the lack of rites of passage and ceremony in our current culture. That void is definitely affecting people's psyche. Every indigenous culture has something of a rite of passage, some kind of ceremonies. And the absence of that, I think, is really bad for us. And it's probably why we've responded so poorly to the injection of fear and everything that's gone on over the last two years and all that. But Dude, couldn't have had a better time. We both have been in this world, swimming in these waters for quite a while. So after a decade, we definitely, I'm glad we came together to talk about some pretty high level stuff and some pretty out there stuff and just a real cornucopia of conspiratorial topics. Just a lot of fun, but you are the man. I am really going to remember this one. Best of luck out there. 
Uh, I guess before we really go, tell them about any other irons in the Ben Joseph Stewart fire. I mean, what else you got happening that people should know about? Any links to leave them with? I know you do have a membership thing going on too. Yeah, and the the membership thing, everything is over at benjosephstewart.com and that's S-T-E-W-A-R-T. So benjosephstewart.com. You can find out anything I'm up to. For the most part, throughout my film career, I put all my films up online for free. And I still do, like, the majority, like, all of my Waking Infinity news is there in front of the paywall on YouTube. But I have a membership section where people can subscribe, mainly because, for one, in this present-day world, I've come to realize that if you give everything away for free, but don't have a way for people to give back then most of the time they won't. But if you offer some of your stuff for people to be able to support, then some people are more than willing to support. Like you'll get a lot of people just going the cheapest way they can, but you will also get quite a few people that will pay 10 times that amount just to support because they can. And I think there's a lot of new models that are coming out like that. Charles Eisenstein and I, he's making a page where the film that I did with him called and the music played the band, that's going to be gift-based, meaning you can take it for free if you want, but if you want to donate some, go ahead. And Nine Inch Nails and Radiohead did that maybe a decade ago for one of their albums, and they realized that they usually sell albums for $10, and it averaged $7 an album. So it wasn't that much of a correction. But benjosephstewart.com is where to go to find me, and what I'm working on now are better edited periodical, basically mini docs. So they'll come out periodically. They're more like thought pieces. They'll probably come across more like my old films, like Chimatica and Esoteric Agenda, but maybe only 15, 20 minutes long, and they'll come out periodical on benjosephstewart.com, mainly because I feel what's going to be the biggest solution in the days to come is an art revolution. And if you hear people saying, the revolution will not be televised. I think that's not so true if there's collective art being worked on. And I do think that Web3 is part of that because it it is this attempt to kind of decentralize and get those who, let's say, if people were to have created Harry Potter on an NFT or something like that, then whatever it does from that point forward is owned by the people who created it. And the same thing goes for like, you know, if it's Facebook, now it's Zion. If you look at Zion, and I think Odyssey used this model, those who own it are those who give their time and attention to it. So I'm excited to see where this goes, but I really want to see an art revolution. More than going to benjosephstewart.com and supporting me, I want you to discover what it is you came here to gift the world with, because we all came here with a gift. And I think most of us We haven't spent the time to unravel or discover what that is, let alone know how we can serve the world with it. And the worst thing you can do with your gift is hold on to it and not share it. So I want to see an art revolution. And that's why all I'm doing from this point forward is making music, making film, and collaborating with people who want to make bigger and bigger worldwide projects. Yes, solid, man. I got so excited. I almost forgot that we had that promotional stuff to throw in there, but those were great words to leave people with. It's been a wild ride. It's only going to get wilder, it seems, but I really enjoyed this. Keep up the great work. You're one of the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. And boom goes the dynamite. Yes, people. (laughs) Ben Joseph Stewart, bringing the heat. I've been at this podcasting thing for a long time now, and there aren't too many names left on the list of people who made the most impactful material for me when I was younger. We've talked to Michael Tassarion and Jordan Maxwell and David Icke and even Jacques Fresco, who I really liked at the time. But Esoteric Agenda really was one of those documentaries I considered to be top tier And if you went back to the boring kiosk in a shitty run-down Missouri mall and said to me, hey man, it's going to be all right. You're going to end up living in San Diego and carving out such a niche for yourself in this conspiracy community that the maker of this documentary is going to know who you are when you have them on your show. (laughs) That reality would just seem so unobtainable. It really has been quite a ride. 
So just keep plugging away at those dreams, guys. Climb the ladder one rung at a time, run the marathon one step at a time, and put the pants on one leg at a time or something like that. But not only is this a sort of full circle thread for me, it was also just a really good interview. Ben has certainly stayed up to date in conspiracy culture, and he's great at summarizing and articulating many different subgenres of conspiracy, let's say. Mud Flood, Hidden History, Antiquitech. But even just talking about the Codex Elementarius speech and Esoteric Agenda, sure, maybe it overestimated the deaths at this point. But it is very much a spotlight on the establishment of the coordinated infrastructure that has allowed for something like the events of our day to happen. The interlocking cabals that rule food and medicine should be primary in anybody's study of the big machine. So I liked it a lot. We talked about some practical stuff, talked about some really out there stuff. A grab bag of conspiracy goodness, if you ask me. And if you only heard the first hour, in the second hour, we talked about what new information has been the most mind-blowing for Ben lately. Esoteric biology, probably my favorite segment in a long time. Light, frequency, water, and DNA magic. PCR, DNA harvesting. Ancient stargates. The past and future of the internet. The elite secret religion and the coming one world religion, as well as the psychedelic revival and MK Ultra. Sign up for Plus if you're compelled to come over to the deep end of the pool at thehiresidechats.com, and thank you to those who already do. Ben is a thoughtful guy with compelling things to say about pretty much everything and anything that I could throw at him, and so it was just a good time overall. Such a good time that he actually invited me to be on his podcast next week, so add it to the unexpected life moment stack. Tune in if you might be interested to hear me on the other side of the mic. But in higher side news, I added new pre and post show plus pitches for the free show because I wanted to make sure we hyped up the seven day trial that is now standard. And it's kind of just important because new people find the show all the time and I just like them to know how we're structured up front. And the post show pitch is great because I don't really like saying the same thing all the time in the wrap ups. Sometimes I only say half of what I should, and so if I can address some of the common questions and concerns I get about Plus and just record a pitch that I think hits all the important points in a tight little package, then I can say a lot less about it in the wrap-ups in general. It's easier for me, it's less filler for Plus members, and I get the right stuff said every time. And if people don't want to hear those things, they can skip ahead or join Plus and it all goes away. I've just never used a post-show ad because it comes after the music, which is a little weird, but there's a lot of podcasts that I listen to where the music plays, and if there's something else there, I hear that as well. And I tend to let my experience be my guide. And as for the next few events on the calendar at HiresideMeetups.com, again, this weekend, January 14th, we have a second meetup for a group in New York City. On the 15th, we have West Yorkshire, UK, as well as Fort Worth, Texas. And then for the rest of the month of January, I'm only seeing three more on there. I'd love to see 10 more on there. But what we have is Denver on the 19th, Nashville on the 28th, and also a tinfoil hat THC swarm crossover that was put on here in Long Beach on the 28th as well. So I did tell a lot of other podcasters, hey, go ahead and use the calendar. I think folks just want to find cool, like-minded people around them. So I'm sure Tinfoil Hat or Gramerica has a lot of mutual listeners. Might as well tell your audience if you want to, and they can make events. I'm totally fine with that. So I did put that out there to people, and I'm going to let this one go this time. But in the future, I am going to remove anything that comes with a cost. We are not plugging events here. We're hosting free and open meetups. So this is a tinfoil hat event, and I love Sam. I wish him well. But these sorts of things don't belong on the meetup calendar because they're not free. And they're not about finding the others. They're about coming to watch a performance. But let this one be what it is. Go see Sam at the event. (laughs) in uh, Long Beach on the 28th. 
They're doing a Shark Tank type of thing where you pitch your conspiracies to the panel. I think it'll be interesting. I might even be there myself. But in the future, these are supposed to be things made by listeners, for listeners, and no-cost events. So that is important to me to keep that focus. And in the future, these kind of things won't be there. But that said, big thanks again to Ben. I think I even got an extra 15 minutes out of him for this one, which is great because we needed to make up for some missing time and some others. But he has done some great work and it was really fun to talk to him firsthand. Thank you guys for listening. As always, take care out there. I've done my part. Your move, Esoteric Agenda Architects, Capstone Cabals, and Puppet Masters of the Power Pyramid. Your fucking move. This is important, hear what I said I'm trying to tell you It's not paranoia, not in my head It's just the hard truth Knocked on your door while I still can To ask you a question Cause I know your head is still in the sand Don't be sheep to your slaughter for the rest of your life Oppressed, oppressed but you're getting woke You say you don't want to be stressed Until the day you die Tough luck, my friend Did you get the memo? Can't you see that we're so screwed? Don't you know we're our kung fu? Can't you just admit we're screwed? I'm gonna tell you this anyway It's a scary dark world But we don't have a choice It seems we're stuck here But you can find noses Drown out the noise Now use that altar End up your magic game And listen to THC You know you go with the entities If you ever see the UFO Don't be sheep to your slaughter For the rest of your life Oppressed, oppressed but you're getting woke You say you don't want to be stressed Until the day you die Tough luck, my friend Did you get the memo? Can't you say that we're so screwed? Don't you know we're our kung fu? Can't you just admit we're screwed? I'm gonna tell you this anyway It's a scary dark world Scarier every day Scary dark world Is another show complete remember as much as you enjoyed this which is just the free first hour i hope you'll become a plus member to hear the full two-hour interviews you also can engage with other plus members in the comments and the forums and you'll find your answer to one of the most common questions i get which is where can i find those cover songs that you use at the end of the show well they are free downloads for plus members too 
And without Plus members, I can't hire the occasional musician to bring these odd cover song ideas to fruition. Plus members are how I'm able to do what I do without ads and without the big machine being on my back. We can fit so much more into a two-hour interview, and I do my best to make it worth your time and money. The conversation only gets deeper, weirder, and more controversial in that private hour. How could it not the way things are going? But the best way to sign up is at thehiresidechats.com, where new first-time subscribers always get a free seven-day trial because I'm just that confident. There's no PayPal on the website, but if you need to use PayPal, then sign up through Patreon and you get all the same episodes. Our website is a credit or debit system, but you can also scope out the other options like a few various cryptos, cash or check mailed to the P.O. Box. And I'll even barter with most people if you have your own business and produce something nice that my wife or kid or taste buds might like. But the architects of consensus reality have made it clear that these themes and topics aren't really welcome on the main stage. And so this is how we secure a little counterculture corner for ourselves, and I hope you'll join Plus because that is the only way it works. Besides, you can cancel anytime right on your profile page. The most common concern I hear is people just being unsure if THC Plus will work with their podcast app, and the answer is probably yes. But if not, we have several high-level app recommendations for whatever phone you use, and the website is made for mobile, too. We're trained to tip a waitress for bringing us a sandwich, but that tip doesn't give you access to a second sandwich. Really, I'm not asking for any more than that, and I think I offer a better service. Come get your second serving of tasty conspiracy goodness in exchange for that small token of your appreciation. Beyond that, let it also be known that we have grown and survived as long as we have by word of mouth. I don't care so much about social media likes or follows, but tell the right people about THC. And not just listeners, but the high-level figures who are better suited to sit down with me than most other hosts. And if you can help me with any of these things, I can work to bring you better shows, which is just a win-win for both of us. Informative, entertaining, and action-packed. It also never hurts to thank a guest you liked if you have the time either. We want them to know people are listening, so they're willing to come back down the road too. Thank you for spending some time with me and cheers to a better tomorrow.